This is Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmail, Member of Parliament for Halliburton for the Lakes Brock, broadcasting live from our nation's capital with two amazing guests on a topic I know you'll be interested in, employment, cost of living, and of course, travel mandates that still remain in Canada. Before we get to our amazing guests and that topic, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Together, we can push back against that ever-moving liberal agenda. If you can't, watch or listen to the entire program right this second. Download it, listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, it is out there with new content every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Without further delay, let's get to our guests, good friends of the show, Melissa Lansman, Member of Parliament for Thornhill in the beautiful province of Ontario, and Stephanie Cusey, the Member of Parliament for Calgary, Mindapur. Thank you Hi, very Mom. much. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Steph's mom. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone's excited that. to be here. That's great. Yeah, That's great. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Let's start with the travel mandates. Melissa is the transport critic. So we are like the one of the only countries in the world still with uh, travel we mandates. We are Why? the last bastion What's of restrictive on? travel. There is, uh, you know what, it's, it's, it's actually getting to the point of absurd. We've got uh, four, five, six, up to six million Canadians who can't travel. Uh, we're the only country that does it. And of course, if you've been to an airport, uh, in the last little while, if you're lucky enough to go to an airport in the last little while and get on a plane and get out of here, uh, you will find long lineups, uh, intrusive uh, testing on the way back. We still have these things and it's simply not based on science. And if it is based on science, it's secret science because we haven't seen any of it. So what does this government know that countries all around the world don't? Well, that's like, a good must question. Have, they must have know something. We, we, we continue to ask and we continue to pressure them every day to put it on the table. When they got the advice, what is the advice? Advice, when they got the la advice last, when they, uh, you know, what is the advice? Uh, and, uh, and they're not telling us. So the advice is certainly different in Canada than anywhere else because, again, if you've gone anywhere else, and we see this from, uh, from news reports, uh, they have allowed their citizens to see their families and go back to work and get back to real life. And it seems that in Canada, we can't get there. So let's bring in Stephanie. Stephanie Cusey, she's the critic for employment, workforce development, and disability, disability inclusion. Uh, what are you seeing? You're probably hearing the same thing. You're from Calgary. You must be hearing from people that would like to board a plane or a train and get moving again. Yeah, no, Melissa's absolutely um, correct. I mean, these restrictions have gone on in, indefinitely. Uh, it, it just seems that Canadians are ready to get back to normal and the federal government is dragging their feet. Really at this point it seems vindictive. It doesn't even seem, as Melissa mentioned, like it's about the science anymore. Canadians want to get back to vacations, they want to get back to seeing loved ones, and they want to be able to do it uh, in a mandate-free environment. And right now this government just isn't allowing for it, Jamie. So was Tristan Trudeau punishing people who didn't vote for him? Well, I definitely think that he is punishing people, and we see this consistently with the liberals and liberal ideology, punishing those who do not agree with their ideas and their views. It's consistent throughout all of government and throughout all of policy, and certainly the mandates and transportation, as Melissa well knows, is not exempt. Absolutely. So, Melissa, cost of living, we're seeing that all across the country. 6.7% inflation. We have currency inflation. We have price inflation. We have shortages everywhere you look. We have uh, problems everywhere. Agriculture is having issues, getting fertilizer in. Price of food is through the roof. Everything's through the roof. Do we see an end to this? This oh, liberal the government seems to not have a path. There is no plan, there is no path, uh, and Canadians are hurting, and we hear it every single day. We see the price of gas, the price of food, uh, the price of housing. There is only one thing that has gotten cheaper in this country over the last seven years, and that's the cost of money. Uh, because we are printing it, we are spending it on things that we don't need, and it's, it's money that we don't have. Uh, and this is all just to continue to buy uh, uh, votes. And, and in, in some cases, buy the NDP. Your, your, your viewers would know uh, that there is, a, there is a marriage. I don't know if it's a great marriage uh, happening between the Liberals and the NDP, but effectively, the, the, the Liberals are spending your money to buy their votes to get that pseudo-majority. So we're not seeing an end to it. And any suggestion of a responsible spending path forward, well, it's not called answer period. We're not hearing any of the answers on that. 225 a litre diesel. What does this do to transport sector? Everything well, is trucked. Look, everything is more expensive when the price of fuel goes up. And it's an ideological opposition to the fact that we have an incredible resource where, where, where Stephanie comes from. We've got enough, uh, enough gas to give the world clean energy. Get off of dictator oil. And we are not 
doing it. And this is because the, the Liberals have an ideological plan to kill our industry. And there's nothing more than that. As a result, you're going to pay more for every single thing. Shoes, clothes, uh, food, everything. Stephanie, this goes back. I know the Liberals always say, how would you solve the problem now? But I think we have to always rewind to how did we get here in the first place so we stopped making these ridiculous mistakes. How many pipelines were cancelled because of this Liberal government? The world is crying for Canadian oil and we have no way to get it to them. You're absolutely correct and that was a point that I touched on in my speech yesterday in the Budget Implementation Act is that again the ideology that we have seen from this Liberal government is destroying entire sectors in our country and that includes the natural resources sector. They've been less than enthusiastic about Line 5. They have miss the opportunity for Canada to provide its natural resources to Europe in an effort to save Ukraine and, and not keep Europe and Ukraine in this terrible predicament that they're in. But you're correct, it goes back all the way to 2015, 2016, when we saw the presentation and implementation of C-48, the tanker moratorium, C-69, the No More Pipelines bill. All of these things have continued to kill the industry bit by bit by bit. And again, it's for, for a silly reason. It's for liberal ideology because our natural resources are such a gift for our nation, as Melissa pointed out. And especially, you know, I'm so blessed in my province where I come from, Alberta, that has so much that they want to offer not only Canada, but all of the world. And this liberal government with their silly ideology is not off offering the opportunity for Canada to do that. Yeah, the Liberals seem to have this hate on, as you mentioned, for, for domestic oil and gas, but they seem open to the idea of mining rare earth materials, but so that you can't extract oil and gas when there's technology like carbon capture and storage, but it's okay to take rare earth minerals from the ground. I, I still don't understand their logic. Yeah, and in addition to that, um, like sell off our mines to foreign interests, which not only present serious national security problems, but in addition to that, only contribute to problems uh, in the supply chain, uh, such as the production of semiconductors. So again, the reasoning of this liberal government is it just it, it is not reasonable. The, the reason doesn't exist for them, and it's all based on an ideology that started seven years ago now, and it, which has done nothing but drive Canada it up further and further into the ground. Okay, you talked about price inflation, you talked about the spending, the printing. My goodness, it actually it's starts it's tiring, to bother right? me. It does, it does, but they just don't seem to listen. The NDP no. are urging them to do even more, uh, but they don't realize that their actions have consequences. Yeah, well, the, right now their actions haven't had consequences directly. I mean, we have a strong opposition. We're holding them to account every day. But Justin Trudeau couldn't get his majority for voters, so he bought his majority from the NDP, and now every single Canadian is going to pay the price. And I think Canadian voters won't forget that, and they will, they will remember that the next time they go to the polls. And our job, our job is to make sure that uh, we throw every wrench into that bad marriage uh, so the Canadians don't pay the price. But you see us in question, you're, 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 both of you are holding them to account. Does it not seem that the, the Liberals, unless, unless they're making people's lives miserable and uncomfortable, they're not being Liberals. Like it, it's one rule, one regulation, one piece of red tape, one tax after another, after another. The more they do, the worse, the worse off we are. And uh, that's been clear. And every time you get up and ask a question, they talk about how much money they spent. Uh, and I think Canadians are, are certainly getting tired of it. Well, you guys know this from, uh, from your writings. I hear it in mine. I have people coming from, from liberal writings in and around the GTA. By the way, I need some more friends uh, <laughs> if, uh, if anyone's going to help. Um, but, uh, but you hear this, this anger and people are exacerbated. They're, they're exhausted uh, and they're struggling. And, and, and this government is not the government that's answering for those struggles. Uh, and I think that that's our job, and I think that's what we're doing. So we're, we're talking about struggles. Uh, we mentioned the oil and gas industry. We've seen, since 2015, hundreds of billions of dollars in investment leave this country. How do you get that back when, when companies are looking at their whole, whole, whole portfolio, they're looking at the global marketplace, and they're thinking, we have limited dollars to invest. Where are we going to do that? How does Canada get on the map as a spot where we should be putting the money from those companies? Well, it certainly doesn't start with the ideological policy uh, that we've seen. And again, um, just rules and regulations that are just absolutely tied to an ideology rather than growing Canada and investing uh, in Canada. 
Uh, you know, I even thought from the beginning of the pandemic that the prime minister could have done an entire inventory of everything that Canada has to offer from agriculture to um, to minerals um, to uh, oil and gas, um, really just to evaluate um, what we have and where those opportunities are available. And instead of coming up with uh, investing um, rich uh, policy, which allows um, many nations around the world, many individuals around the world, companies around the world, the opportunity to invest in Canada, they, they keep focusing on their ideology and uh, just not getting things done for Canadians with serious consequences for Canadians with no part of our economy left untouched from, as you mentioned, cost of living, gas, but also housing. We have a housing crisis in this nation right now. I touched upon supply chain. We haven't even got to labor shortage, which makes everything else more expensive. So, you know, every single step of the way, they are not thinking about business in Canada, the Canadian economy. They're focused on their, their ideology and frankly, maintaining power, as Melissa alluded to. I mean, the NDP has lost all credibility at this point because you can't be in a relationship of supply and confidence on one side and then stand up and criticize them in question period on the, on the other side. It's absolutely uh, ridiculous. So they're able, they, you know, they're able to, to, to write as many checks as, as they want and, and they've done that. And again, the, the losers are every, everyday Canadians because as, as you indicated, like, no one is investing in here in Canada at this time. Yeah, it is really sad. You want to know? I will that? also, yeah. I'll say this. How, how do you do so little with so much mm. in this country? Mm. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the real question. We have the most educated workforce. We've got, you know, food to to uh, to make us in sort abundance. of secure uh, and feed the rest of the world. We've got enough energy to make us independent and power the rest of the world, so the dictators aren't doing it instead of uh, us. We've got a smart workforce. We've got, you know, hardworking Canadians ready to, you know, to get their hands dirty. And yet. We're, we're nowhere on the world stage. Um, and, and people don't look to us as a place, uh, you know, to park their money or grow their family or even move here and, uh, and have fun. And, and we've, got to, we've got to look at that as, uh, as a serious issue going forward. We need way more people. Um, we need to ask ourselves what, this, what the plot is here, because I'm not sure that they have, and certainly this last budget was a mishmash of a bunch of words and like a bunch of press releases stapled together, but it certainly wasn't a visionary document, not for this government and not for this country. Well, let's quickly touch on that and then we'll wrap up, get your final thoughts. But when you're talking about Canada being excluded from these conversations, we've seen that a lot in the military file. When the, the U, Australia made a deal for nuclear submarines with the UK and Canada, it, we're a Commonwealth country. We weren't even part of that conversation. How many security meetings took place with Ukraine and other conflicts and other situations? Canada wasn't even invited to those conversations. This is this is something that is goes beyond the business market. It goes to to our relationship and, as you mentioned, Melissa, our our view on the world stage. It's damaged. It's absolutely damaged. You know. Back in the days of the Harper administration, you had titans like my predecessor, Jason Kenney, like John Baird, who had a clear set of values for Canada, a clear set of values for Canada on the world stage that included justice, democracy, human rights, the rule of law. This government has no strategy for its foreign policy. Again, we see it's ideological and we see that it's reactive, as we saw with the last minute trip finally this week to Ukraine by the Prime Minister and Foreign Affairs Minister. I mean, this is something that should have occurred a, a long time ago, but they're always late to the party and they never do the right things. And it's because, again, they have no set of values which guide them in their foreign policy the way conservative administrations have. Okay, we need to get out of here. Uh, I always give the guests the final word. So, Melissa, you know, I'll, take I'll, it away. I'll, I'll finish on this. You know, five eyes turned into four eyes, turned into eyes wide shut for uh, for Canada. And at one time, I think we chose uh, we chose principle. Uh, and I think these guys, uh, these liberals, have chosen popularity. And you can see the damage that is done to to Canada's uh, reputation on the world stage. And just you know, sitting by the phone, nobody calls us anymore. Mm. That's so, right. Very sad. Stephanie? You know, we have a supply chain crisis. We have a cost of living crisis. We have a labor shortage crisis. We have a housing crisis. When are Canadians going to wake up, realize the horrific situation that we are in, and demand change? As uh, liberals and NDPs, I would, I would say for sure. Well, yeah. yeah.
Yeah, I, I hope the time will come very soon because uh, they, I don't think, I don't foresee things getting better with this policy that we're, we're experiencing. Now, I, I also don't think the NDP or Liberal really care about the working Canadian population anymore. Well, it just doesn't seem that way. We're going to be their voice. Absolutely. We are going to be their voice. This is great content. Please like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Together we can push back against the ever-moving liberal, liberal agenda. That was Melissa Lansman, the Member of Parliament for Thornhill, also the Transport cl Critic. There we go. Tongue-tied at the end. Stephanie Cusey, Member of Parliament for Calgary, Mindapur, also the Critic for Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion. We do appreciate you tuning in. And of course, if you didn't get a chance to listen to this in its entirety, you can download it and listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, it's out there. 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, every single Tuesday, we will have new content for you. And as always, remember, low taxes, less governments, more freedom. That's the blueprint.